Okay, there he is. Hey, Ken. Hello. Hi. So everyone, this is my friend, Ken. We're both in the same program. We just finished up our first year of the uh, MS Statistics program at Cal State East Bay. And Ken's rocking our ASA Cal State East Bay background. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. So this is a group project that um, we did with our other classmate, Sarah. Um, I guess, Ken, which would be the best? Well, I guess let's go from the, the, the slideshow. That might be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the work. Okay. And yeah, so basically, I guess we'll just kind of show you guys what we did for our project. And then um, we have like a, I think about three or so GD plots in here. And yeah, and we'll see, show you guys what we did. And then if you have any ideas of what you guys would have done different. Uh, yeah. So let me make sure this knits. Since I moved the pictures, it might not knit properly, but hopefully it does. Okay. And everyone can see the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. You can do it. Okay. So I guess I could start off from the beginning and then I can alternate between like the actual PDF and the code. Um, but yeah, so our project was called Gender Wage Inequality in STEM and we presented it on April 28th um to our class um so basically our um sorry i'm just moving so basically um we're doing well i'll just read the introduction um so do we choose our career path based on gender-based social roles or based on top salary although many countries such as china have incorporated women into their labor power to become a powerful economy, women still choose careers that are more in sync with gender stereotypes. And undoubtedly, personality characteristics associated with women are sympathy, kindness, warmth, and, ref and they reflect a concern about other people. However, the traits associated to men are achievement, orientation, and ambitiousness, and concern about com accomplishing tasks. Now, these characteristics are very noticeable in the stereotypical association of men in the worker role and women in the family role. Um, so more schools are encour encouraging girls to enter STEM programs and provided them with many resources to succeed in these types of careers. Um, despite these efforts, women tend to choose careers where the median pay is lower. So for our data, the data was obtained from the American Community Survey from 2010 to 2012 public use microdata series and has been already subsetted to concern only STEM majors, particularly with interest in women majoring in STEM. Um, for each row in the data set, which represents one major, there's a collection of details and statistics about the major, such as the type of major, like the major category, whether it's like engineering or health science, and the proportion of women in the sample of individuals working in that particular field and other relevant pieces of information. So the data that we use, you can find at the 538 GitHub. It's, again, it's the women in STEM C C CSV, but um, kind of subsetted from the college majors one. And so the dimensions of our data set are 76 rows by nine columns. And the variables are median, which is the median earnings of full-time year-round workers, rank by median earnings, major code, major, which is the the major description or the name, the major category, um, um, the total number of people with, within the major, male graduates, female graduates, and women as a share of total. Um, so our research question um, was to try and define associations within STEM college majors that influence median wages. And our goals are to explore the data for STEM college majors and to create a predictive model for median wages. And that's kind of, repeating the same thing. So just again, what associations exist within STEM college majors that have an effect on median wages? And the goal is to explore the data for STEM college majors and to create a pre predictive model for median wages. I guess if Ken, if you wanna talk about some of the plots, I'll let you go. Okay, so um, I constructed um, a stack bar chart where I looked at the gender proportions for eight, every major category. 
And um, as you can see here on, on this um, stack bar chart, you could see that um, typically, you notice that there's a huge proportion of men that are filling up the engineering category. And then you could see that there is a large amount of women, you know, concentrated in the health profession, which confirms a lot of the, you know, questions, a lot of the insights that we're thinking, assumptions we have about what kind of careers and it confirms, you know, idea of gender roles, you know, playing a factor in the major category, major choices. Um, anything else you want to add, Lydia? Or... Can I ask, I, I, I think I missed it. This is only focusing on China. Is that correct? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, this no. is, this is a sample of data. US. This is not. I believe China. it's US data, um, but that was just, um, with regards to the introduction that was, um, from one of our references, like uh, yeah, okay. just kind of a general, generally what's going on. Okay, so background information related to China, but this is US data. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. that's right. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, so there's like the, um, the bar chart that Ken made. And by the way, Ken is like our, our coding guru for all of this. <laughs> he did the, a lot of the coding, so really awesome. So like, for this one, we had originally started with um, like side um, side by side bar charts where it had um, I think we went by like the number of women and the number of men, but then I felt um, we felt kind of like actual visualizing the proportions was really cool. So we and I think by default the colors were like blue for women and then the or rather like the teal for women and then like the salmon color for the, the men. So we kind of switched that around to kind of like the idea, like the blue for boys, pink for girls kind of thing, which is cool. And then like we added like the annotations for like the actual proportion, which I think was cool. And I could show you guys the code. And then Ken, if you want to actually talk about the code. Yeah. Okay. So let's see here. Yeah, so this is the kind of the, the code that I used in order to kind of create um, th that chart. So you could see here, in especially line 86, um, I was just filtering out a couple columns and then line 88. So in order to create that bar chart, I had to create a diff another data frame in order to get the statistics that are needed to generate the proportion of men and women. As the original data set wasn't formatted that way, so I had to yeah, yeah. So this is yeah, this is the original data set. You can see that um, that we that it doesn't have the, the statistics for the proportion of men and women since they're just in raw totals. And so what I did was, you want to go back to the presentation slides? Yeah. And so what I did was um, I did a group by where I group um, the statistics based on the major category, and then I did I use summarize function in order to get the proportion of of men and women just, just by say, for example, the proportion of men, I would take um, for each major category, I'll sum all the totals for the men in every major in that category. And then I divided by the total of all the men and women for that major category. And I did that for each of the major categories. And then, and then right here, line 91 is, are just label, are just um, extra conflict in order to set the position of the annotations for the for proportions that you see on the bar chart. And then I did the same thing for women from line 93 to line 95, which, and then once I generate these summary tables, I then use them to generate a ggplot, a stack bar chart, which starts at line 97, where I, the, where the X axis is the major category, why is the proportion with statistics which I generated, and then I the color co it's color coded based on sex, and then so this so line ninety eight and one hundred just extra code to format the bar chart, changing the the size of the te text and all of that, and then and then line one one hundred one is where I started pasting the labels for the proportions that you see on the bar chart using that label pause, which is the calculated coordinates for the um, proportions labels, which I did earlier. And then 
lastly, um, line 102 to 104 are just extra formatting options I did in order to kind of make it look nice. So anything else you want to add, Lydia? Sorry, I keep muting myself. <laughs> but yeah, so that's um, that chart. And then let's see what else we did. So yeah, so, and then you see again, um, the x-axis is the major category. So of the 76 majors, they're um, categorized by one of five majors, um, major categories, which is like biology and life sciences, computer mathematics, engineering, health and physical sciences. And so within those, we saw like the median wage for individual majors ranked from like 26,000 for zoology, which is a biology and life sciences, and then 110,000 for petroleum engineering, which is an engineering. And then overall for um, all the majors, the median was um, 44,350 and the mean was 46,118. And again, the so we set the major category as a factor, again, in the following levels, biology and life sciences, computer mathematics, engineering, health and physical sciences, um, so that we could distinguish the variation of share of women within the major categories and also with the median wages for each major category. So again, just showing you um, like specifically like how engineering and computer, computer and mathematics have like a way larger proportion of men to women. And then health has a way larger proportion of women to men. And it's somewhat balanced in biology and life sciences and physical sciences. So then we go to the box plot of median wage by math major category. And again, you see where engineering, which is like drastically dominated or male dominated um, major category tends to have like a higher median salary um, followed by mathematics, um, computer and mathematics and uh, biology life sciences, health and physical sciences are a bit lower, closer, um, not completely closer to the median, but yeah. And then let's see, you'll see we have like two outliers. This one is actually petroleum engineering. And then this one, um, astronomy and astrophysics. So you'll see it again in one another one of our plots. So then we did a test of the difference between the major categories. Um, so based on our box box, we noticed our box plot, we noticed that there may be a significant difference between median wage by major category. So we ran an ANOVA to test out our hypothesis. Um, basically that the median wage for each of, there was no difference between the median wages was our null hypothesis. And then for our alternative hypothesis that there was a difference between at least, um, there was a difference between at least two of the median wages. So then based on our ANOVA, we rejected the null hypo hypothesis and concluded that there's a statistically significant difference in median wages by major categories. So here we did a jitter plot and the jitter plot um, shows median wages by major category. Um, and we also have like share of women um, here. Um, so then the size of the size of the actual point are like dependent on how many women are in those major fields um, compared to men, like the actual percentage. Um, so again, our outlier here, petroleum engineering, um, which is fairly, fairly small dot compared to some of the others. Um, and again, a very high median wage and astronomy and astrophysics, which is, I'd say it's kind of similar to like 50%. Um, yeah, and again, um, Ken color coded the categories and let's actually go to the code to show some more. So Ken, do you want to start with the box plot, I guess, or? or yeah, I, I think I could go go quickly go over the box plot, as I think. Okay. So that's the, um, so so line 30, 136, starting from there is, is the code that I use to generate the box plot. So it's pretty, pretty standard. So I, I set my X axis as the major category, and then Y is the median salary for each of the data points in that major category. And then... I use the function g on box plot, which is from the library ggplot in order to generate the box plot. And then 
So from line 137 to 9 are just aesthetic changes that I made, just adding the, the labels, the title, and then adjusting the, the text axis for the X axis to making sure that it's readable, otherwise it would overlap. And then adjusting the title of the plot, you know, just for aesthetic reasons. So that's generally the code that I use to generate the box plot. And then moving to the jitter plot for the median wage by major category. So in order to track the outliers that, that we mentioned about, which is petroleum engineering and astronomy and astrophysics, I, I created um, a separate um, data frame where I, where I, you know, to hold those two data points that are outliers, which is petroleum engineering and astronomy and astrophysics, which is stored in the data frame outlier points in line 162. And then from starting on line 163, I generated um, a ggplot, a jitter plot, where, you know, I had my x axis is the major category, y is the median, and then the color coding for the data points is is based on the major category. And then the size of the data points is affected by the share of women, which is the statistic of the proportion of women in that for each major. And then lines 164, I, I, I created a, a jitter plot and then I set the alpha equals one fourth in order to make it transparent. So that way you could see where the salaries overlap for each of the data points. And then 165 to 168 are just aesthetic changes that I made in order to make it readable, making sure that the text of each of the major categories don't overlap, and then making sure that the title is formatted a certain way, and then changing the legend positions so that way it's within the graph. And then line 169 is where I start in putting the labels for the outliers. So using you know the, the stored data frame that contain the outlier points to sort of mark where the outliers are. And then line 170 is just aesthetics, just to add a title and labels. And then 171 to 172 are just modifications I made in order to make the legend a little bit more aesthetically pleasing as by default, when you do a legend in ggplot, it automatically adds the letter A for each of the color-coded boxes. And I wanted to remove that as I, I, just, I just wanted like a solid, solid color. So, so that code from lines 171 and 172 just removes that letter A that ggpop puts in the legend by default. And so, yeah, that's kind of the, the code for jitterplot. Yeah, I was just gonna show um, the changes. You may wanna de delete the plus. Yeah. Temporarily, yeah, yeah. It, should, it should work. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can see how there's a letter A right there, like that's automatically included in whenever you do ggpot legends. And the code above was kind of to remove it as well as format it so that way that, you know, share women is not kind of blocking the outlier there. And also that we don't have the redundant legend for the major categories as it's already color, co color coded and looking at the graph, it can easy to tell like which color goes to which major category. Yeah. It's kind of what? I'll change it back. Okay. Just so I don't forget later. <laughs> when did that letter A come in? I haven't come across that before. Is that just for jitter plots? I think it's because we have, um, it was giving us like two legends and I'm not sure why um because it was giving us a legend for the point size and then the legend for like the color mm -hmm. so i'm not sure exactly why it was doing both um i don't think it's necessarily only a uh let me see where's the book i, used I don't think it's only a jitter plot thing mm -hmm. but i think when we went over I forgot which, like scales and legends. I think it does something similar to that. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but there was, 
and I think because I think I um I did this um presentation but it gave us like I think there's a time where it gave more than one legend and there's like a way to consolidate them I have to look for it another time though <laughs> Yeah, I think by default, when you do like a fill or a color, like it automatically provides a legend. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, so some of the code I did in line 71, 72 was just to remove that redundant legend since it's already color coded by a major category. And we you can kind of tell intuitively looking at it visually. And then the other is just to arrange it's the share women legend. So that way it's not overlapping any of the points. Yeah. And then I'll show you like in our paper, something we ended up actually combining those two, um, combining the box plot and the jitter plot um, side by side, which is another cool thing Ken did. Let's see. So yeah, it's a paper based on the same presentation. Um, and again, we have the, or we have the stacked bar plot. I don't think we made changes to this one, but we did make a few changes to these ones. Um, for example, you may have noticed for the other one, it said, um, like for example, where it's a hundred here, it's a hundred, um, it's a hundred thousand versus actually saying, um, actually saying the, uh, sorry trying to find, I think it's this one. Yeah, so like in these ones, you see where it says the uh, 100,000 instead of just saying 100, like in these ones, so that was another change that was made. And when we we're trying to, because we put them side by side and it's a smaller amount of space, we were having a problem where the, the names of the major categories were um, either they would over, if they were horizontal, they would overlap. And then if they were vertical, it was just, it didn't look very nice. Even if we switched it from like, um, if we switched it from like the, uh, I don't know how to put it, like 90 degrees to 270 degrees, it just um, wasn't like that aesthetically pleasing. Um, and then also another, change Ken made was originally when we have this, um, the legend for share women, it um, shifted a little and it cut off the EN. So that was another change that Ken made. And I can go to the code for that. So that's the box plot. So yeah, so this where we added, um, so this is again the code for the box plot and the jitter plot, the side by side. So there is the line of code added for scale x discrete, um, where the labels we change it to one, two, three, four, and five, um, rather than actually having the name of it. And I think when you that. Yeah, so yeah, again, without having, if we don't add that thing to change the labels, they're kind of overlapping um, rather than having the numbers. And then, and then Ken, if you wanted to talk about changing the position of the legend. Um, yeah, that is actually on, I think it's, let me, let me look up code so it's actually i think it's on um oh yeah it's on line 115 yeah oh, is, yeah. is where the, the i changed the position of the legend oh yeah so i think originally it was like 92 oh, that one we had it as like 92 i think and yeah so it cuts off the um it cuts off the whole title of it. So that was another change we had to do.
but I think other than that, um, oh, also, um, oh yeah, also in the scale Y continuous, where we changed the labels, so it still has the same breaks where it was like um, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, and 100,000, but we changed the labels to 40, 60, 80, and 100. Um, and then within the title, we change it to median salary um, with thousands of dollars rather than it being hundreds, like you see in these ones. Yeah. Okay, and I guess we can go back to. Um, But yeah, so we have to do our presentation before submitting the paper. So there are a few things that we changed for the paper that weren't in the presentation. Um, but yeah, so we left off here. And then, yeah, so then there was further cleaning um, for the analysis. We removed the major code and rank as they weren't relevant predictors for our purposes. So you see that in like a uh, wrong thing. Um, yeah, so we have, this is like the complete original data set. And then that too is where we got rid of like um, the major code, the name of the major as well, and the rank just for easier um, data manipulation based on like the major category, which we had set as a factor. Okay. And Ken, if you want to talk about the scatterplot matrix. So um, I could go over that. So for the scatterplot matrix, we did a scatterplot matrix in order to kind of see the relationship that, that, we, that variables may have between each other and to detect any possible instances of multicollinearity. And so looking at the scatterplot matrix, um, I mean, so far, um, it can be quickly noticed that um, you can see total and men are like positively correlated with one another. And then, which kind of makes sense as total is essentially the sum of men and women, which, so it's essentially is a column that is very dependent on the values of the other two columns. And then, and then you can see that with median and share of women, there is quite a negative correlation there. And so, which led us to believe that, um, to, to wonder if like median has anything so negative association with share women, seeing that you know, as the generally median goes down, the share women tends to go up, and which is one of the things we were trying to, you know, look into. Yeah, and then the slide just kind of re reiterates what Ken said, where there's the negative association between share share women and median, and then where we wanted to investigate more um, issues of multicollinearity between total men, women, and chair women, and um, multicollinearity where it's like um, within your regression model, there's variables that are basically redundant because they don't add any extra information based on the other variables that are already within your model. Uh, but yeah, Ken, if you wanna talk about this then. So I, just to check for multicollinearity, I, you know, I did a, correlation matrix in order to see like the relations between each of the variables. And you could see how that um, with total and men, there is a correlation value of about 0 0.82, which kind of makes sense, which again, as iterated before, total is the sum of men and women. So there is going to be some connect correlation there. And then you can see at total and women as a really high correlation of 0 0.91, which which already confirms what we know and that total is the sum of men and women. So there is going to be correlation there. And then, but overall, um, it's other than those two notes there, um, everything seems to check out. So then. Yeah, I'm gonna switch over to the, the paper. I think what we did for our paper is instead of having the scatterplot matrix and 
the separate correlation heat map, what we did was use GG pairs, which I don't I don't remember if we've gone over in the book club yet, but it basically did a combination of those two. Um, so yeah, even though it's not colorful like the heat map, but yeah, so it does the. Um, sorry, so it does the um, the you see the correlations again, um, so the same ones where it's like total correlated with women is 0.91. And then total correlated with men is 0.82. And again, the scatter plot matrix here where you see median, median on the upper left and share women on the lower um, lower right, where you still see again that negative association. So I guess we can go over maybe the presentation um, code first. So this one is actually a fairly simple like um, base R, the pairs function where it's median by um, all of the variables that are in dat2. Um, again, where dat2, we may remove the actual major, um, the major code and the rank. And then this one, um, Ken, if you wanna talk about this one. So this is kind of the code that I use to create the correlation matrix. <clears throat> and so it's using um, ggcorplot, which is another package related to ggplot2, which is it can be used to generate the, the correlation matrix. And that's kind of the code used to get this correlation matrix. Yeah. And then, oh yeah, and then show you guys all of the packages we did use. Let me go to the top of this one. Yeah, so the packages we did use were like the Pac-Man data just to load. So we could use the pload library and we use dplyr, ggplot2, ggpubr. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, that's Honestly. just for um formatting. Like this formatting? It was how I oh. put the two plots together next to each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, GG cool. repel, GG core plot, GG ally. I'm not familiar with that. And then the other ones were like um, for the statistics. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So like for the also with these plots, where it can use like the GG arrange to put the two plots side by side. Okay. All right, and then, yeah, so kind of if you wanna go over this one. So before getting, you know, um, creating a model, we decided to look at um, our response, our chosen response for our median, see the distribution of median. And we've noticed that looking at this plot here, you can see that median has a very right skew. And so it's not normally distributed. And so since um, a multiple linear regression relies on assumption of normality for the, normality for the distribution of the data set, um, we decided to do a box Cox transformation to see if there's any transforms you needed to in order to get that normality that we're looking for as necessary for model fitting. And we, we could see that um, the box Cox interval is roughly around negative 1.5 to somewhere less than negative 0.5. And through the result of this test, we got a rough rounded power of negative one, which meant that in order to get a sense of normality, um, you would have to do an inverse transformation of the response median. And and I this is, it's not on the slides, but I did double check um, the distribution of meeting after I did the transformation, and it does look more normal distributed. And while it works, uh, one of the things we note is that the, given the nature of this transformation, if we're going to do any kind of interpretation, we anticipate that it will be very difficult to interpret given how much the transformation affects the units, which may make it difficult to read in a real world context. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the graph because I just realized that was also a oh 
that's in the slide. It's another GG plot graph, so I figure we can talk about that one. Um, so yeah, so this is a um, geom histogram um, where Ken added the line, the like a density line, rather than just having like the only having the bins, there's actually the line to kind of see it a bit better. I don't know if you have any more details about this one, Ken. Yeah, so geom density is just um, like an extra thing I added on in order to more better show the distribution of like the data a lot to better visualize it. And so I guess, um, yeah, because if you don't, by default, it doesn't have the density line. And so, yeah, so that's just an extra line I added in order to get that, you know, density line. And then, so yeah, so as far as building our predictive model, we started off with a full additive model, but we realized it removed basically all of the variables except major category. Um, so especially since our, we were kind of looking to see associations um, kind of based under, we decided it would probably be more, um, it would be good to look at a model with interactions um, so that we'd have more variables to work with. And also if you look at our, um, our adjusted R squared, um, which is what you look at, since it's multilinear regression, you look at the adjusted R squared rather than the R squared. Um, we have adjusted R squared, R squared of 0 0.549, meaning that 54.9% um, of the um, variability within median could be explained by this model, which isn't really bad, but it won't really give us the insights that we're looking for. So then we, um, um, we've, and again, since the additive model removed it, removed all but major category, we ran the model with the interactions. Um, and then we did a stepwise, um, step, we ran the stepwise function to reduce, to get the smallest AIC. And this was the model that we ended up with, um, where it, still, it contains major category, um, men, women, share of women, and then an interaction between men and share of women. Um, and then you see that we have basically everything is um, significant, at least to the um, zero, zero point, where alpha is 0 0.1. Um, and although you see like share of women doesn't appear significant and then men doesn't appear significant because share of the interaction term of men and share of women are significant, we would still keep both of those within our model. Um, and then Ken, if you wanna go to this one. So looking at the model, we noticed that, you know, and we were curious if whether we could remove the predictor women because we found that it's as mentioned before, women is kind of redundant when you have total or men, since they're kind of correlated with one another, especially since also share women is essentially a proportion of women to, in total, to the total. And since share women is just women over total, it might be redundant to have women in there. So we decided to do um, an ANOVA test to see if the predictor women is significant. So we did a partial um, F test in order to see if um, predictor women is significant. And based on results, we, we found that we failed to reject the null hypothesis, which is that women is not a significant predictor. And given the results, we decided to remove the predictor women. Yeah. And then, yeah, so then we got to the reduced final model where it's um, again, the inverse median um, by major category, men, share women, and the interaction term between men and share women. And this is it all written out. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, <laughs> but it's based on um, where these are the coefficients for each of these um, variables. Um, and yeah, those are the coefficients for the variables. And then, so what we did, um, since we wanted to like test the predictive power of our model, 
Um, we did prediction intervals for median, um, the inverse of median. Um, we did particularly statistics and decision sciences because we're statistics majors. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, um, so when you actually um, run this specific, specific code with the data that we have, um, like in our data, the data frame where, let me see statistics. So it's this line, line 35, where statistics um, is a, in the major category, computer and mathematics. Total, um, the totals are 6,251, where men are, um, the number of men is 2,960, the number of women is 300, 2,091, and then the share of women is approximately um, 0 0.53, um, and the median salary is $45,000. So yeah, so again, where median salary was $45,000, um, and when we did the prediction interval, we got a fit of like 40, 41,240. And again, because this is inverse, even though this is lower, it's kind of switched the um, upper and lower. So the lower um, prediction interval was 3,997. And the upper, well, if it was regular, the upper would have been um, 60, 61,595. Um, and our units are dollars. Um, yeah, and then the model diagnostics, Ken, if you want to go over that one. Given, so given that we're working with a multiple linear regression, um, part of it is also checking the assumptions that we made with model. model. So we did some diagnostic plots in order to see if the assumptions necessary for multiple linear regression are, holds up, you know, given the data set we're working in the model we have. And so the plot on the left is a plot of the residuals versus fitted in order to check for constant variance. And so looking at the plot here, it can be seen that um, there is, that the, the the, the points don't seem to have any pattern. The residuals here, which by the way, more specifically the standardized residuals don't seem to have a, are correlated with the fitted values, which generally indicates that the assumption of constant variance for this data set holds up pretty well. And then on the right is the normal QQ plot where we check for assumptions of normally distributed residuals. And so looking at this um, QQ plot on the right, you see that other than a few points at the tail ends of the distributions um, deviating from the normal line, the assumption of um, normality for the residuals does hold up pretty well. So it so far, it seems that normality and constant variance assumptions hold up pretty well. However, just to be sure, um, we also did numeric tests in order to verify those, in, those um, conclusions we obtained previously uh, earlier. So for the test on top, the studentized Bruish pagan test, I ran that to test for constant variance at the significance level of 0 0.05. And given the p-value is 0 0.8582, we failed to reject and thus we have verified constant variance. And then for the test on the bottom, we, we to test for normality for residuals, we did the Shapiro-Wilkes test and given that the the p-value is greater than significance level 0.05, that confirms normality residuals. So thus, we have found that the assumptions for fitting a multiple linear regression model holds up for this data set. Yeah. Okay, and then to check for multi I did I looked for variance inflation factors. So, um, so I decided to run a couple of, of of algorithms in order to get the various inflation factors, which indicates um, how much does the standard error grow if there is no multicollinear for each of the variables. And, and generally, a uh, general rule of thumb is that usually any value greater than five usually indicates there's some moderate collinearity or more. And looking at it, it seems that um, a lot of variables seem to be okay. And then you have share women, which has a value of 5.21, which means that, you know, without multicollinearity share women, the standard error would grow by about roughly 2.25, roughly, which is just the square root of 5.21, which again, kind of confirms uh, what we mentioned in previous slides and that there is some multicollinearity with share women and other variables since share women is related to the total. 
and total is just the sum of men and women. Okay. Yeah. And also, I'm just gonna go back to these slides because I think these are ggplot as well. Yeah, these are ggplot. Uh, Okay, so it's these ones. Yeah, so then I don't know, Ken, if you have any notes on the code here. I mean, so I mean, for notes, um, not much, but um, that's the kind of the code that I use to generate the residual plots in the QQ plot. So the code for the residual plot is from line 337 to line 341. So I, in order, so I created a GG plot where I use the standardized residuals, you know, to as for for the plot, and then fit it against the fitted values, the predicted value for the model. And, and then GM H line is just to add um, like a like a y-intercept to compare against. And then just the GM smooth is just to add like um, a, a curve in order, which helps me to see visually if there's any kind of pattern whatsoever with the residuals. And then and then the rest is just the code for the QQ plot that I used, right? Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, so like when you comment out the geom smooth, it takes away that through line that was there. Yeah. And then... Okay, so I'm so yeah, so for our conclusions, um, we do believe that there is an association with gender and median wage of STEM majors, and we can predict median wage of STEM majors based on the major category, the total number of men in the major, the major, and the total proportion of women in the major. And again, since we were all statistics majors, I was saying we should have all <laughs> majored in petroleum engineering. <laughs> um, yeah, and then for further research, we were thinking that if we had sex disaggregated data for median wage, we could see the difference in median wage by gender for each of the majors. And then maybe if we had time series data, we could um, then see how median wage changes, say with an influx of women or an exodus of men from a given major. And what made me think of that is something I learned recently where the term computers used to be actually a job title where it was actually women who were like, um, I guess it was kind of data entry. Um, and yeah, now seeing where computer engineering, um, all these tech jobs make so much money and where it's heavily a uh, male dominated field now. And then also, since we only looked at STEM majors, it'd be interesting to see if um, these variables, uh, major category men and share women are associated with median wages for all majors and not just STEM fields. Um, these are the these are the references. Um, the this is our bibliography with the references we use. Um, again, with um, the one quote where it was regarding China was in with these books. Um, I forgot which one, honestly. And then for the code, um, the supplementary R script, you could visit um, my GitHub um, for the gender wage inequality in STEM repo, um, which is here. I can put it in the chat. Uh, yeah, and actually, this is where we got the original data set. Um, again, it's from 538. The data is women in STEM, uh, what's in, within the college majors repo. And any more, if the actual repo had way more um, variables than we wanted to handle for this project. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to check out this one, this data set. Um, play around with it, you can find it here. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> if anyone has any questions or comments. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lydia and Ken. And you did a, a wonderful presentation, very interesting thing. Um, so uh, thank you very much.
Yes, very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it for but yeah, if you want, you can always um check out my the repo. Let me see. Yeah, you could always check out our repo, um, the slides and the paper here and the data set we use. And yeah, thank you all for uh, watching our presentation. Really appreciate it. <laughs> I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. 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 -bye.